Thank you. I love the way I emerged from behind the faulty towers. Um, right, how do I work this? Do I just press this? Okay, great. Hello everyone, I am indeed Emma and I must say I feel that Tommy was a very hard act to follow. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I haven't met any presidents and I haven't been on the telly and I'm rubbish at gardening. However, I hope that to give you an insight into what we've done at Salivary Lang Cancer over the last five years. And to go to Chris Lewis's point from earlier, when he was saying not much optimistic has happened in the last five years, I hope that this will demonstrate that there are pockets of optimism out there. So, Salivary Lang Cancers are rare. So Ali kindly showed us earlier that the prevalence of head and neck cancer diagnoses in the UK each year is about 12,500. For salivary gland cancers, it's about 700. That's one in 20, roughly, um, head and neck cancer patients have salivary gland cancers. And um, that in itself has um, a extra level of challenge above and beyond being a head and neck cancer. So primarily salivary gland cancers are in the salivary glands in the head and neck area. And that is your parotid, your sublingual, your submandibular. They also occur in other secretory glands in other parts of the body. Your lacrimal gland, and some areas I'm not going to point to. The first one being the breast, and the second one being the vulva. They also occur in the skin. And they behave differently. So adenoid cystic carcinoma is one of the most common, and it grows along nerves. It's often asymptomatic, and head and neck cancer patients generally struggle enough to get diagnosed, but when you have no symptoms at all, it's even harder, obviously. There are also no risk factors. So it's a com they're complete equal opportunity cancers. They don't care what colour your skin is, where you were brought up, what age you are, what you eat, or what you've done. So there's no way of identifying somebody by their behaviour, their age, or their ethnicity. So to summarise, no known cause, there's also no known cure, they're really, really rare, and when I was diagnosed, frankly, no one really cared, and that was 11 years ago now. The other, the second major issue for salivary gland cancers are that there aren't any approved drug therapies that work, and that includes chemotherapy. So patients have surgery and radiotherapy, and then they may go on to a trial if they're lucky. And sometimes we see patients that actually they do have chemo and it does work but it doesn't work for all the others so research is desperately needed and we need to understand these cancers so that we can do research and move it all forward so sorry patient bear with me i noticed no one else has had to use water on the stage so i'm afraid i'm the first so to illustrate this, I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of a patient experience. So this patient is asymptomatic, um, they're out of context, this person was in their sort of middle, late 30s, and they had these sort of pains and shimmering in this side of their face, and GP said, oh, I'm not really sure about that, have some steroids. That didn't help. Went to the dentist, oh, when well, you grind your teeth, you know, and you've got a stressful job, have a gum guard. So they did. Um, and this kind of continued for about 18 months, two years, including a scan, which apparently there was nothing on. Anyway, eventually, it's found out after this diagnostic odyssey that this person had a stage 4 adenoid cystic carcinoma, which had grown from their, um, for, well, their secretory glands in their hard palate all the way up to their skull base. And there are many stories of such um, difficult to diagnose um, patients on our website there. Second example, and this speaks to another key feature of adenoid cystic carcinoma, is that, um, I didn't know this was a, um, a loader, by the way, I thought it was going to come off the front. Anyway, um, typical patient journey. So 
you find that there's something here, you have an ultrasound, the cancer doesn't show up on the ultrasound. Now, because adenoid cystic carcinoma grows really slowly, it doesn't often show up on pets either. So it is really difficult to diagnose from that um, perspective. Symptoms persist, MRI scan is, um, is, is done, and they show a mass on the floor of the mouth. Biopsy shows it's adenoid cystic carcinoma. By this point, the cancer's already metastasized in the lungs. So lungs are found through a CT scan, and oncologist chances it with some radiotherapy and some cisplatin as a partial response, which is actually quite good. 2017 to 2021, the disease progresses because there are no other treatment options. When you get to January 2022, it's getting even worse. You get added to a wait list for a trial, and then you start a new trial. Um, and that may or may not be helpful. In this case, it wasn't. And then lenvatinib is a kind of go-to drug for people in this situation. So you can see this person has gone, what, for seven years. They're still there. They're still not met. So they may still be living their life. But as one patient described it, they're standing on a burning platform. So, I think I've been through quite a, list, quite a lot of this, what is challenging, but just to summarise, no risk factors, limited treatment options, lots of people living with and beyond with these diseases, and also if you've had radiotherapy, as we all know, the after effects of those, because we love radiotherapy, it helps save our lives, but it is the gift that keeps giving. Um, um, and research and access to trials is really hard because there really haven't been that many trials open in the UK and beyond. And when you are doing research into a rare cancer, low patient numbers is a key issue. And going back to the point that was raised earlier, if you have lung, breast, prostate, colorectal, there are lots of you which make trials easy. You are abundant with samples and with people to go into trials, all very easy. Combined with the fact that for saliva gang cancers, they don't all occur in the head and neck region. So you have got people that are in these different treatment pathways. If you are diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, that just means that you don't have those three markers that have been tested when your tumour was profiled. You might have adenoid cystic carcinoma, but there isn't currently, currently a referral mechanism for these patients to get referred into a central salivary gland kind of area. But there might be now. Anyway, it's a massive urgent healthcare problem. So, what did we do? Five years ago, nearly five years ago, five years ago in April next year, myself as the patient advocate and Dr. Robert Metcalf as the medical oncologist, he works at the Christie in Manchester, came together to collaborate. And the definition of collaboration is the action of working with someone to actually produce something. So we produced a charity, and it was a real sort of back of the back of a bag packet, really the wrong expression to use, sorry. You know, um, back of a piece of paper at the kitchen table, and um, we are just delighted that five years later we are still going, and I'm going to tell you what we've done. But while I'm here and I remember, I just want to say a massive shout out to Chris and to Sharon, who have consistently supported us across these five years. Me as an individual, the work that we've done, and the charity, and we will always be grateful. Thank you. So, and I really missed you at ESMO this year. You weren't there. So yes, Chris and I and ESMO, before I even had a charity, and he had the swallows, we sat in the sunlight at the European Society of Medical, Medical Oncology in Madrid, and I sat there going, and Chris drew diagrams for me about things that we could do. So yes, so that will never be forgotten. Always remembered fondly. This is one of our gatherings. So we run regular gatherings now, and they are patient-led. That's by me um, and other people, to the point that was made earlier. And you can see um, that we have our patient community and we have our clinician community. That's Dr. Metcalf on the left. He's a medical oncologist. And on the right is Steve Churchill, who is a GP. And more about that in a minute. Um, 
And through this collaboration, we all sat in the room, patients, researchers and clinicians, and not just from the MPT, from the allied health professional networks as well. And we said, well, what do we need to do for these cancers? And how we, well, then we got on to how we we're going to do it. And we produced eight aims. And these eight aims are like our Ten Commandments. They are what drive us. They are the thinking behind the charity, they're what we fundraise about, and that we, what, how we benchmark ourselves and our success. And I won't go through all of them in detail, but I'll go through them quickly. Um, to support and provide information, because there's not that much information out there, and of course everyone needs support. To support advances in the understanding of living with and beyond these cancers. To improve the rate of early diagnosis. To optimise the pathways to diagnosis. To support the development of guidelines, to the point, the discussion that we were just having. To understand the effectiveness of different types of radiotherapy. We've heard about um, protons, which we now have in the UK. There's also a thing called carbon ion therapy, which you can get um, in Europe, and some of our patients have crowdfunded to get access to that. Um, and we look at the development of surgical and radiotherapy treatments, and we get better outcomes for patients. And of course, the holy grail, the standard, the drug treatment that would work for all of us. So not much to do then. Anyway, this is kind of what we've been doing for five years. And, and that, this is what I feel like sometimes. I feel like I am the most boring person on the planet. All I seem to talk about is life and gland cancers. Whenever I can. So we presented to the GPs at GP Pulse. I come to conferences when I'm allowed, um, like this, and Beacon for Rare Diseases and ESMO and, ASMO, ESMO and ASCO, as, I, as I've already mentioned. Basically, any time and anyone that is interested, I will talk about saliva gland cancers too. But I can talk about other things just for the record. Um, Dr. Metcalf is at the Christie, and there is a biobank there, and this is really key. For these cancers, where you don't really understand what's going on, what's driving them, we need patient tissue and blood samples. And they go into this biobank, where Dr. McCarthy is now taking UK-wide referrals, and they um, and he takes referrals from all over the UK, um, of all saliva gland cancers, so adenoid cystic, acidic cell, mucoecodermoids, um, all of them, all 23 of them, um, and um, from all different anatomical sites, not just head and neck, although the head and neck people are really the only ones that have supported and know about us at the moment. Um, and it pushes forward research. And it is really one of the key ways in which research um, will advance. Um, and we collaborate nationally and internationally, because obviously there aren't that many of us, that if you've got a few more in France and Spain, you want all of that information to come together. Um, and to help patients understand why gene profiling and biofranking is important, we produce some leaflets. And I know lots of people yawn when you hear a leaflet, but actually it's written in layman's terms. We co-produced it. It's got videos of people who have shared their samples and why they did it and how it's helped. And we've got a stall out there, so if you are interested in any way, please do come and talk to us and we can show you the leaflets. Um, and then this biobank and the information that they've managed to um, gather has allowed the team in Manchester to publish um, some papers. Um, I won't go into detail about these, but those are examples, and we've got more information on the um, on the store and um, the international collaboration. So, as I've mentioned earlier, I am a member of the International Ray Cancers Initiative, also of the European Reference Network. Sorry, excuse me. And we're allowed to stay in Europe because as patient advocates, we're not paid. The clinicians were asked to after Brexit. Um, other research organisations that are focused on these cancers, like um, the uh, ACCRF in the US, um, and anyone else worldwide that's interested um, in these cancers. Um, it's my last slide. Um, I couldn't get a picture of my dog, unfortunately, so I've improvised with that one. Um, some of the things we're doing, so to go back to the discussion we were having about dentists and GPs and primary care, we have we put our first grant out, which is hugely exciting for us, 
um, and it's still open until the 4th of December. So if you know any prodigy that would like to take on the task of writing some primary care guidelines for surviving lung cancers, and I don't just mean GPs, I mean dentists as well, um, and then get those through NICE, we're offering funding to do that because we think it will address one of the key unmet needs for our patient population. Um, the National Cancer Research Institute, which you may have heard of, it unfortunately closed in January. Um, Dr. Metcalf, myself, and actually Professor Karun to my right, are taking forward the Salivary Gland Cancer Workstream. Um, and we'll be going to advert for people that are interested in the next few weeks. Um, so watch out for that if you are interested. And we want people from across the board, including patients, allied health professionals, your traditional MDT, um, everyone we want to bring together. There's a new phase of research um, starting at the Christie after um, a, a recent project is finished. And we are, as I mentioned, celebrating five years. And we are mapping out exactly how we're going to do that. But I'm looking forward to it. And that's it for me. Um, I just want to say thank you all for listening. And thank you all for everything that you do. Whether you are a patient, a caregiver, or a healthcare professional in whatever way, shape, or form that is, you are here because you are interested, you are engaged, and you are making a difference. And I don't think we say thank you and well done to each other enough, so thank you and well done. And I'm here for any questions, and there's two members um, um, who have volunteered from our community to come and help who are also here for questions, and thank you very much for listening.